Now let's look at parametric polymorphism, more precisely the system known as the Hindley-Milner type system, because that's as strong as parametric polymorphism can get with all the nice algorithmic properties being intact. The uh, underlying language, well, it's the same as before. But the uh, set of types is different. What we have now is that the set of types is given by the formation rules. Well, what do we have? We have the type int, we have the type bool, we have function types, we have product types, and now we've got something new. We've got type variables. And then we've got something more. We've got something called type schemes. And type schemes are types with quantifiers. A type scheme can be either a type or a quantified type for all a So we can uh, say that uh, a type is general in some sense. The reason why we want to have type schemes is such that we can be able to type functions such as the identity function. We want to have type A to A for all A. And then uh, if need be, then we can have this general identity function behave as a function of type integer to integer or as type bool to bool or whatever we, we want. So we have to have a notion of, of specialization of type schemes and we also want to be able to conclude that that an expression has a type scheme, so we also need to find uh, type schemes from types, and I'm going to talk about that now. So I'm going to talk about uh, free and bound type variables. Consider as an example the type scheme for all a, a to a times b. Here, the type a is bound the type variable A is bound because there's a quantifier for all A. So this is a bound type variable. But the type variable B is a free type variable because there is no quantifier binding B. And we write if we have a type expression T, that's the set of type variables A such that A is a free type variable in T. In the type environment E we can also talk about the free type variables of E and it's uh, the union of all the free type variables in T, where it's the case that there is an X such that E of X is T. So it's the set of all free type variables that are mentioned in E. An example is probably a good thing if our type environment is a type environment that says that x1 has type for all a, a to a times b, and x2 has type c, then the set of free type variables in E, well, 
What free type variables do we have here? A is not free, B is free. And what free type variables do we have here? C is free. So it's B and C. So now let's look at specialization. Specialization is the idea that from a type scheme we can get a type. How do we define that? How should we define that? Well, um, well now uh, remember that if we look at the definition of the set of types and type schemes, then every type scheme is of the form a sequence of quantifiers and there are k quantifiers and k may be zero, so there may be no quantifiers at all, but every type scheme has a sequence of quantifiers and then a type. And uh, we say that T1 is, if this is a type scheme, T1 is a specialization of T if uh, there exist types. T1 up to Tk such that T1 is the type that you get by taking the body of the type scheme and then replacing A1 by T superscript 1 and similarly all the way up to the last type variable replacing it by Tk. So it's an instantiation, an example of that would be that the type int to int is a specialization of the type scheme for all a, a to a, because here we can replace a by int throughout. We have that int to int is what you get by taking a to a and then replacing a by int throughout. So that's specialization. Now what about generalization? Generalization is the notion of creating a type scheme from a type. Well, if we conclude that an expression has type A to A and nothing's mentioned about A, we can of course add a quantifier. We say that A can be any type. So suppose we're given a type T and a type environment E, then we can close the type with respect to the type environment, and that is, by definition, uh, a type scheme for all A1 up to for all AK dot t, where uh, the type variables a1 to ak, well that's the set of free type variables in t minus those that are free in e. Here's an example of that. If e is the type environment says that x has type B to B, then close with respect to E of A to A is for all A, A to A. <coughs> and the overall idea is that whenever we make no assumptions about the type variable, in the sense it does not appear in E, it can refer to any type. This all leads to uh, the notion of something called principal types, and that's uh, a very useful notion that uh, one often uh, mentions when talking about type systems such as the type system for Haskell, the type system for the ML-like languages. We say that 
at type T is principal. For an expression E and a type environment E, big E, if it's the case that the type T makes E well typed under E, and moreover, whenever it's the case that E has some other type T1 then it's the case that T1 is a specialization of T. So, principle is really the same as saying most general type. So the principle type of an expression is the most general type. And what we would of course like is to have a, a type system that is able to to uh, type uh, terms with principal types and ideally, we're not going to talk about this yet, but ideally we would also ha like to have uh, a type inference algorithm that can infer principal types. Now with all these notions safely under a belt, it's actually very easy to give the type rules of the Hindley-Milner system because these are the old rules of the simple type system and two new rules. One is the rule called projection or specialization. It's a, it's a rule that says that if we know that the variable x has the type scheme t in our type environment and our type t is a specialization of t, then we can conclude that x has type little t. And the other rule is the generalization rule. And the generalization rule simply says that if we know that E has type T, then E has type T, where T is a type scheme that we find by closing. E or T, sorry, with respect to E. So um, the projection rule lets us specialize types and the generalization rule lets us uh, conclude that an expression has the type, that's a type scheme. And that's really all we need. With the type rules that we had before and the two new ones, we can then type um, the identity function. To conclude this part, let's see how that was done. Now here's the de derivation tree that assigns the type bool type int to the term let f equal lambda x dot x in f of true comma f of naught. How do we build this derivation tree? Well, um, if we use the var rule, we can conclude that x has type a if we assume that x is type a, and then we can use the abstraction rule to conclude that then lambda x dot x has type a to a. But then the generalization rule says that we can quantify over all the free type variables in a to a that are not mentioned in the type environment so we get the general type for all a lambda x, lambda x has, dot x has type for all a a to a. Ah, so now we can type this part of the local declaration. Now we have to type the body of the local declaration under the assumption that f has type for all a, a to a. And here, to do this, we can use specialization in form of the projection rule. We get that if f has type for all a, a to a, then f in particular can be seen as having type int to int. Given that we know that the constant naught has type int, then we can use the application rule to conclude that f of naught has type int. We can do the same over here. We can use projection over here to conclude that if we assume that f has type for all a, a to a, then we can specialize this 
and concludes it here, f is type bool to bool. And um, if true is type bool, which it has, then we can use the application rule with these two premises and we get that f of true has type bool and then we use the product rule here to conclude that f of true comma f of naught has type bool to int so we have all the premises of the let rule in place and we can then use the let rule so notice that in this tiny example we've used both generalization here and specialization in the form of the projection rule here and here.